You're welcome to be seated. It is my honor to invite up Phil Stamen to give our Devar Torah today, to teach some of his Torah. Thank you, Rabbi. The honor is mine. Shabbat Shalom. I appreciate um, being given the opportunity to once again share a few words of Torah with you. You know, I've done this through the tenure of three rabbis and the pandemic, and it's always been an honor and a privilege to do so. But if you're new and you haven't regularly attended on Shabbat Shuvah, because after all, we've, we've just spent two long days in shul, a little shul fatigue is understandable. You may wonder why you have me speaking today and not Rabbi Rubenstein. The rabbi has so much to do during the high holidays that it's been our Beth Torah tradition that we give the rabbi a break and a congregant fills in. Somehow I've managed to do enough of a good job that I'm here again. <laughs> but I'll, as always, I'll attempt to be brief Hope I don't go too much off course and think of things as I'm going along, but to paraphrase the great sage Shammai, I will attempt to say little and do much. The law of averages just about caught up with me. The law of averages, you know, it has its variance to an explanation. It basically says the more something is done, the more likely a particular outcome occurs. So after 10 years, I thought it caught up with me on the first day Rosh Hashanah when the rabbi began talking about forgiveness, which I've talked as a subject before, and I, my first thought was rewrite, but hopefully I have a different take today. Uh, my Mishnah Yoma says so much about what we can do as forgiveness and interaction with people. You know, it should be pretty simple to follow those guidelines and the suggestions we got from the rabbi, but I've been concerned about underlying problems with communication in this day and age. As George Bernard Shaw said, the single pro biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it's taken place. You know, it, it, communication is a tricky thing. It doesn't have to be something that you can necessarily hear. We have communication, for example, at work. When I do spreadsheets, my coworkers know if there's things highlighted in yellow, that means it's not complete yet. If I've let someone in, traffic stops, someone's trying to get out of a parking lot onto the road and I let them in, there's nonverbal communication there, but it's taken place. It can happen on the opposite, too, and I think far more to the negative side. Some drivers won't let you in out of the parking lot. Some drivers these days, I'm finding it more and more, think school zones just don't apply to them, or red lights for that matter. I've been honked at more than once because I now wait when the light turns green you have to not double check, but triple check. We saw negative communication during the pandemic when people refused to wear masks or when people looked down on people were, who were wearing a mask. So it's not just what we say. But if we want to truly make sure our communication is effective, we need to make sure it's in a manner that both parties understand. And I think there's much in the world these days in undermining and eroding that. And I'll give you an example. You know, mass communication is here and it's good and it beats, you know, one email from the shul beats having to send out a few hundred letters. No one will argue that. But, you know, one of my pet peeves is I sent an email. Oh, well, that solved everything. Some time ago, I came up with what I call the four fallacies of email. That it's been received, that it's been read, that it's been understood, and that it has been or will be acted on. 
Another problem with email, you know, I don't know about you, but it just buries me. If you buy something online, join an online group such as Nextdoor, make a charitable or political donation, good luck keeping up with the avalanche of unwanted emails. They just keep popping up and popping up. If I unsubscribe because I didn't contribute to the Senate race in Ohio, sure enough, I'm going to get something about someone running for Congress in Minnesota. I have friends who figured me out, and if there's an email they really need me to see, they text me first and say, heads up, you should look at that. And I'm like, oh, okay, that draws my attention to it. It's a great example of meeting someone where they are or prefer to communicate from. I think it's important also to consider personal dynamics. In my early work history, I had a manager that taught us a lot about dealing with customers. He called it the three types of people. And you can apply it to many things. I like to joke and do this for work, such as at work there's those who get things done, those who watch things getting done, and those who wonder what happened. But seriously, the, the three types of people are very important in our interpersonal communication. Type one. Type ones are great. You always have an easy conversation with them. Everything's easy. Quickly, something can come to a resolution. Type two is a little more, more difficult. It might not happen right away. But generally, type twos can come around. They may say, you know, initially, what the heck was Phil talking about? But maybe give it later thought and say, oh, that was pretty good. Well, I hope that happens, the outcome. Um, type twos can become type ones. Then there's type threes. Can't do anything about a type three. I might as well argue with this piece of paper instead of arguing with the type three. Type twos can sometimes slip to type threes, but a type three can never be anything but a type three. And if you're able to recognize those different types of people, it might lower the frustration and help you adjust your communication. If you know you've got that type one, hey, hey Cliff, can you, on next on Yom Kippur, we need to do such and such. And, oh, okay, thanks for letting me know, easy. Type two, why are we doing this, Phil, that you mentioned? Oh, I see, okay. So it's important. This was in my devarb, I brought it up the other day, worth bringing up again. I mentioned the great Joe DiMaggio being asked why he played so hard every day. He responded that there might be someone in the stands that had never seen him play before. The great ones don't need to broadcast their stature and standing or turn it to their advantage. And when we speak of a great one, we read about the interaction between Abraham and Abimelech in the Torah reading on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. Abimelech, the king, is the one who approaches Abraham. He sees all that Abraham has and respects and maybe fears him. But after Abraham accuses Abimelech's people of co-opting his wealth, Abimelech apologizes profusely as on the defensive. Abraham is now in a spot where he can press his advantage in this conflict and probably get whatever he wants out of it. But what does Abraham do? He says, here, take some, take some of my sheep and goats. Let's make a pact. Two powerful people making a deal coming to an amicable conclusion. When you're talking about forgiveness, when you have uh, someone with a position of power on either side, maybe a parent and child, a supervisor and employee, it may not lead to true forgiveness and resolution. Like Abraham and Abimelech, there first has to be mutual respect and understanding. Well, I'm certainly not advocating any position contrary to Mishnah Yoma and with the advice the rabbi gave us. I do think it's also worth examining how to, quote-unquote, meet with another person. 
For some, personal interaction may be difficult. One person's text exchange or email could be more meaningful to them than a face-to-face. -face. It's a new age, and those younger than most of us here today, they have different ways of communicating, and that is a reality we should think about. But for some, the resolution may not come. How do we deal with that? I've used this before, but I think it's worth repeating. In the words of Don Henley in his song, The Heart of the Matter, it provides a practical message. There are people in your life who've come and gone. They've let you down. You know they hurt your pride. You better put it all behind you, baby, because life goes on. You keep carrying that anger. It'll eat you up inside, baby. And sometimes forgiveness is more for ourselves than someone we may have offended. I've told this story in a Devar a number of years ago, but it's a great example. Many, many years ago, I got a letter saying, somehow I goofed up, I was behind on my dues, and I did not react well. I was very involved in the shul at the time, and my reaction was more along the lines of, how dare you, don't you know I do this and that? Not a, not a particularly nice response, but some years later, after getting to know the person, that I had sent this response to, I started feeling badly about it. One year before Yom Kippur, I sat down with her and I apologized. And the ironic thing about this was, her response was, I forgot all about that. It was, it was no longer a weight on her, didn't bother her, but it was certainly a weight on me. And at that moment, it was as if a weight had been lifted off me. It's not only that we should be focused on making amends with others, as Mishnah Yoma teaches us, but also that we should also let things go which are of no value to us. How can we affect real change if we cannot move forward? And communication and moving forward, forward leads me to this week's Parsha Hyzenu. In an interesting little twist, a couple, it was it last week we had a Q&A and I was looking at the notes to the portion and it hit me. You know, this is, Hyzenu is, even though we're not done with the Torah, Hyzenu is the last portion that we will read on Shabbat because when we read Vizot Habracha, that will happen on the morning of Simchat Torah. And just the whole Sefer Devarim has held fashion, fascination with me. Going back to the beginning, where Devarim begins with, Ele HaDevarim Asher Diber Moshe El Kol Yisrael Be'ever Har Yardain. These are the words that Moses addressed to all Israel on the other side of the Jordan. I've always seen this as a, both a physical and metaphysical event. After traveling through the desert for 40 years, it's time for the people to cross over the Jordan to the land God has promised. And it's not just a simple matter of um, one day it's on this side, and the next day it's on the other side of the Jordan. In 40 years of journeying, there were many stops along the way for many extended periods of time. I dare say that some of the encampments could have become like home. Just like God had commanded, Abram to leave his home and go to a place he would show him? What circumstances come up in our lives that would lead to a move? Will we have the courage to get up and move? Perhaps not to the land that God shows us, but to a place where we begin the next part of our lives. And from a spiritual, the metaphysical perspective, are we ready to move forward? What changes have we made since last Yom Kippur? What have we done to make our world, the world so desperate, need a peace and tikkun olam a better place? What will prevent us from resuming our old ways after we return our moxerim to the shelves after this coming Yom Kippur has ended? The moxer will be the same, perhaps with a little bit of dust, but we are capable of change. I like to keep in mind the words of the Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson of Righteous Memory, who would frequently quote the Mayamadanian adage, 
Each person should see himself as though the entire world is in delicate balance and with but one deed, he or she can tip the scales for good. We have a juxtaposition of today's Torah reading and Haftarah for Shabbat Shuvah. The Torah reading, as we see on most multiple occasions during Moses' final discourse, is harsh at times. We are reminded over and over of our wickedness and being a stiff-necked people. If we're looking for comfort, we'll have to look hard to find it. The faults, failures, and disappointments to God and the children of Israel are a reminder of how we stray away from God and away from his commandments. It almost makes me want to start saying a shamanu right now. The rebellion of Jews against God's covenant brings with it the rebellion against decency and common sense that reflects itself in the continuance of persecution from the rest of the world. Moses makes that abundantly clear in his words. The truth of the matter is, even though this son of Hizenu is the one that Moses commands the Jewish people to commit to memory and to regard as the eternal wisdom of Jewish history, the Jews have never quite believed and followed this admonition. And we in our time stumble through the fog of current events, groping for an innovative way out of our problems. Moses calls the people of Israel children who have lost my trust. This is because the terrible tendency to repeat past errors and constantly search for the Jewish pension to adopt the latest cultural and sociological fads. Trust is built on wisdom and tenacity. The Song of Hyzeno provides us with an ample supply of both of these necessary traits that alone will guarantee future survival and success. At the end of Hyzeno, Moses gets to see the land, but he can't go forward. His punishment is set. I've always had a problem with that because if you, if you look at any leader throughout history, I think it would be easily to say that Moses probably had the most challenging job in history. And Moses messed up one time. In Exodus chapter 17, God tells Moses, take along the rod which you struck the Nile and set out. I will be standing there before you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will issue from it and the people will drink. So once before in here, strike the rock. But later in Numbers chapter 20, God instructs Moses, you and your brother Aaron take the rod and assemble the community and before their very eyes order the rock to yield its water. Thus you shall produce water for them from the rock and provide drink for the congregation and their beasts. So we're going to provide water from the rock again. In his anger and frustration with the people, Moses strikes the rock twice with his staff. The people would know no different. He produced water. But God is angry with Moses for disobeying him and not having trust in him. His one mistake is costly. How many times have we seen something in life where we think, I only made that one mistake? Fortunately, we get it mostly, at least I hope not, we have not offended the creator of the universe and we get another shot. In trying to get another perspective of this, I read a recent book by Rabbi Pinchas Brenner, who was the chief rabbi of Caracas for over four decades. And he writes that this event has generated various valuable interpretations and teachings that are still relevant today. One of the lessons to emerge from this event is the importance of words and dialogue as powerful tools for resolving conflicts and leading people. Instead of resorting to force or violence, Moses should have spoken to the stone, thus demonstrating that words can significantly impact and lead to problem solving. Through words, changes can be achieved and realities can be transformed. Another crucial lesson is the responsibility of leadership. Moses, as leader of the Jewish people, carried a great burden on his shoulders. However, 
when he was denied his most cherished desire, he blamed the Jewish people for this divine decision. Moses disavowed his personal responsibility as a leader by blaming the Jewish people for his mistake. Moses was part of the people, and if they didn't react the right way, maybe it was because their leader didn't guide them properly. And that seems harsh things to say about Moses, but it, it's a deep thought. During the Musaf service on Rosh Hashanah, we heard the Unatana Tokef chanted, Who shall live and who shall die? Do any of us truly know what is written for us in the book of life? Moshe Rabbeinu knew. He knew when he disobeyed God at the waters of Meribah. He pleaded with God again to let him cross over the Jordan, and God replied, Enough! Never speak to me of this matter again. Let's ask ourselves, how would we handle it if we knew God's ultimate plan for us? Will we accept our fate with quiet dignity and resignation? Will we rebel and complain? Hopefully we can atone for whatever sins we have made. But unlike Moshe Rabbeinu, we don't know these answers. And we are at Shabbat Shuvah, a time of deep introspection and contemplation with not not with quite a bit of fear and trepidation, at least for me. Again, we're not just at the office or some other place. We're bef standing before the creator of the universe. That final judgment draws near and will be sealed for the coming year. Will I be worthy of inscription in the book of life? Moses tells us that what he has said is no trifling thing. It is life itself. The Torah is a guide for how to conduct our lives and is there for us to make use of. Or, in the words of the Electric Light Orchestra, it's a living thing. The answer to these lofty questions is far beyond my ken, but here is my message from the heart for this Shabbat Shuvah. Don't wait until Kol Nidre to open your moxer again. Look over the psalms, piyuts, and prayers that are read and repeated throughout Yom Kippur beforehand. Let's be real and face our shortcomings up front in a thoughtful and meaningful manner. Secular life has its ups and downs, but Torah tells us what's really important. Let's take heed of Moses' words as a source of inspiration and strength. And before I close, I want to add... To anyone that I have given offense to you in the past year, and I know I can easily do that just when my, my attempt to, th to sing, um, I humbly ask for your forgiveness. Gemar Chatima Tova, may we all be inscribed for a sweet, happy, healthy, and peaceful new year. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom.